troubleshooting the people who can't enter. Um, I'll just use my phone. Who knows, I'm realizing if I'm going to be troubleshooting the people who can't. So we, we, are, we are live. <laughs> All right, friends, we have about 60 people in the waiting room, so I'm gonna let them in and let them know what to expect in terms of our starting time. Welcome friends. We're going to start a little bit after seven tonight at 7.05. This is Lena speaking. I'm the education coordinator at Pendle Hill. So I just invite you to settle in if you wanna get maybe a drink of water, maybe remove a distraction from your space so you can be really present. Um, just encourage you to start arriving and we will start at about 7.05. So about eight more minutes of just gathering. We have a lot of folks joining us today on Zoom as well as on YouTube. Um, so we're gonna give ample time for folks to arrive. Um, but thank you for being here. Really happy to have you here. Everyone will be muted. Um, you can chat um, to me and Francisco here at Pendle Hill. We'll be doing tech support for the call, um, but we don't have the chat open for everyone just in respect to um, allowing us to be really present to what George has to say tonight. Um, thank you for being here. Um, you are all muted as it is, and uh, you may notice you do not have the ability to unmute yourself at the time. Um, that's because we are expecting over 500 people on the call today, and that's going to be uh, quite a cacophony of voices if everyone's able to unmute themselves. So uh, thank you for uh, permitting us a little bit of that, that uh, decision making on our end. It's going to be helpful for everyone later, I think. And welcome to those who are still just arriving. Um, you're hearing the voice of Lena Blunt. I'm the education coordinator here at Pendle Hill. We'll get started here at 7.05. 
I welcome you to just settle in. Hello friends who are just joining us. We'll be getting started at 7.05 tonight. Thank you for your patience. We'll have a couple more folks join us here. I know we have a number of people joining us on Zoom as well as on YouTube. If you're just joining us, you may notice that you are muted and unable to unmute yourself. Um, that's because we anticipate a several hundred people on this call tonight. So thank you for understanding. You can use the chat, but the chat will only go to me and Francisco here at Pendle Hill. Um, that is also intentional so that we can all be focused and listening to George um, as he shares later tonight. There'll be a number of opportunities for you all to speak with each other. Um, and also to submit questions at the end um, that we will um, open up some space to discuss. So there will be time for that coming. Um, welcome for folks who are just joining. We'll get started at 7.05. Welcome friends who are just joining us. We'll be getting started at 7.05 here shortly. Thank you for being here. My name is Lena. I'm the education coordinator with Pendle Hill. Another disembodied voice on the internet. Welcome everyone for being here. Welcome friends, we're gonna get started in about two minutes here.
Welcome. Beautiful. Well, thank you all for being here. My name is Lena Blunt. I'm the education coordinator here at Pendle Hill. And I'm so glad to welcome you all tonight to our first Monday lecture for October. Um, this is a lecture series that we do um, on the first Monday of every month. Um, and I'm so excited to have George Lakey joining us tonight to discuss can Quakers and others help prevent an American slide into dictatorship? Hint, nonviolence will be key. A little bit of housekeeping for tonight. Um, we are um, live streaming on YouTube as I speak. Um, so we've made the decision to keep participants all on mute. You may notice you cannot unmute yourself. Um, please forgive us for that discretion, but uh, it does make it easier for us all to hear each other. We have several hundred on the call here tonight, and it also makes this recording um, more accessible to folks who are watching on YouTube as well. And We've also disabled the chat for tonight. Um, that is a feature that uh, can also be distracting during these types of conversations. So um, George has very thoughtfully um, planned and designed some times where we can talk with each other, um, but we will not be using the chat uh, to do that. Uh, so just to make that clear that that resource, if you have any technical difficulty, um, you can use the chat to speak to me or Francisco Burgos. Um, Executive Director at Pendle Hill, we're both standing by to do tech support, um, but uh, we will not have the chat enabled for other reasons through the call. Um, it will be enabled for a uh, question and answer later on. On that note, I'm going to take down this, this opening slide so that can better see your faces and can better welcome uh, George, who uh, will be speaking with us tonight. In addition to being a mentor and friend of mine, um, George has many, many decades of nonviolent direct action strategy and movement work. Um, George is a member of Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting. Um, is recently retired from Swarthmore College, has taught at Pendle Hill, Woodbrook, Haverford, and Penn. Um, and his most recent paperbacks are Facilitating Group Learning and How We Win, a Guide to Nonviolent Direct Action Campaigning. As is our tradition at Pendle Hill, I am going to invite us all to go into some silent worship. Uh, to open this evening. And then George will be speaking out of the silence um, as we dive in.
Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Pendle Hill. So many decades now I've been coming to Pendle Hill and sharing and learning, and it's a pleasure to be here again tonight. I'm not much of a gardener, but I do know that it really helps the seeds if, first of all, we break up the ground before planting them. <laughs> I suppose some hardy seeds wouldn't manage to grow anyway, but it helps enormously to break up the ground first. And I've been thinking, one way I've been thinking about this time we live in is as a time when there's a lot of breaking up of the ground that we're used to, the structures that, we're, that we've been counting on, getting broken up and changed. And my guess is that we're like the seeds, that we can actually grow more in ways that can surprise us in that environment, that new environment, that mess that's been made. If, if we have access to the water, seeds need water, we need the water of life, also called God, also called spirit, also called Jesus, that water of life that sustains us and assists us to grow. And we also need to connect with the fertilizer, <laughs> which to my mind is the connections with others, the connections with other organic material that, that help us to grow. Bill McKibben told me that very often after he speaks about the climate crisis, someone will come up to him and say, well, Mr. McKibben, uh, what would you say that I could do about this climate crisis as an individual? He likes to say, first of all, stop being an individual. <laughs> and I can't agree with him more. We're only likely to grow well we're only likely to make a difference if we, uh, if, if, we, uh, if we do that, if we make those connections. And that's one of the things that even though this is Zoom land and that's hard to do, we will promote those insofar as we can through this, the uh, breakout rooms. And we'll hope that those who are watching on YouTube will also find ways of being with others and absorbing this material that we'll share tonight. So of course the thing most on our minds right now is this uh, for this lecture is this threat to our electoral process to the orderly transition from one president to the other and we know that we our current president keeps uh, refusing to pledge that he will respect the transition of power uh, because he withholds uh, the right to decide that the election was in some way marred in such a way that any other result except a result that favored him could not possibly be a legitimate, uh, a legitimate uh, a result. And therefore, since legitimacy is everything, he will claim the legitimacy to continue on for another four years. So we are in a way lucky that he's been doing that because I've been dipping into the research that's been done on coups, on power grabs in other countries. And I've learned that one of the things that almost never happens is for the coup plotters to announce ahead of time their plan. <laughs> Usually they're, they're plotting in attics or basements or wherever they're plotting. And and, and counting on the surprise to numb people and, uh, de and, and, and uh, get them to freeze such that they can gra grab the reins of power and be able to uh, make their, their transition. And uh, so in a way we can be thankful that we have a president who is often very reckless and, uh, and likes to reflect more on himself than on anyone else. And so we get an inside view of what might be happening with us. And thank you very much for that part of it, be, uh, Mr. Trump, because we many, many, many people are preparing for that eventuality. It's not that I myself am confident that he will try a power grab if, uh, if he's not clearly uh, 
elected. I think it's possible that he won't, that wiser heads around him will talk him out of it. And yet, just as I have insurance policy for my house, and fully expect it not to burn down. So also I like to have an insurance policy about something as vital to our life as a society, as this political structure we've been used to. And for that reason, I think it's smart that you are here to consider ways of preparing for yourselves. And I've found it enormously illuminating to be engaged in this preparation process myself. What are we bringing to this challenging time? That's always a question I ask myself when another challenge happens, which can be just something on the street that's really strange and it looks like I ought to intervene or whether it's something that looks like tomorrow is going to be very tough. I ask myself, what is it that I can bring? And I want you to have that opportunity as well. And so uh, I would like you to close your eyes wherever you are and I would like you to um, go inside. Notice your breathing. Go inside. And uh, maybe you'll want to shift your position a little bit, make yourself a little more comfortable or put your feet more squarely on the floor. And support yourself to go inside and ask yourself that question. What is it? that I'm bringing to this moment. Please begin. Now, if you will gently bring yourself back to the rest of us and uh, open your eyes if you closed them. Lena is going to uh, form practice groups, or rather, uh, it's Fernando, it's Fr Francisco. Oh, good, it's Francisco who will do the uh, task of forming breakout rooms in which you'll be able to compare notes on what it is that you bring to this moment. My guess is that you'll be interested not only in what the others say, but you'll find more to say for yourself. Please, Francisco. You will need to accept the invitation to the breakout room. So you may see a pop-up that says the host is inviting you to join a breakout room and you'll need to click join. It looks like most folks are figuring that out. So there should be a pop-up that says the host is inviting you to join a breakout room and you should click join. For those of you who are viewing this on YouTube, we are sorry that it's not possible to include everyone in this. And my suggestion is that you, this might be an excellent time to grab a pen and some paper and go more deeply into this question for yourself. If you happen to have other people around joining you and viewing this, grab them too.
Looks like we may have 18 folks who haven't joined your breakout room yet. If you can click join, that pop-up should be on your screen and you can join that breakout room for discussion. Here we go, a couple more folks are getting that. Folks should have an invitation to a breakout room. If you click join, you'll be discussing this question, what are we bringing to this challenging time? If you can join your breakout room, you'll be discussing that there. If you're joining us from YouTube, as George said just a moment ago, please take this time maybe to journal, or if you're with friends, discuss what you're bringing to this challenging time. We have a couple of latecomers, so if you don't see the invitation to join a breakout room, we just invite you to perhaps journal or reflect on this question of what are you bringing to this challenging time. For those of you who've been in the call, you should have an invitation to join a breakout room. You will have to click join in order to join that breakout room. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. The rest of the group is in breakout rooms right now. We're glad you can join us and just invite you to journal or maybe talk to a partner if you're around other people about this question of what are you bringing to this challenging time?
For those of you joining us via YouTube, you'll not be able to do the breakout sessions. Those are very unique to the Zoom platform. Um, but we just invite you to reflect on this question, perhaps journal, turn to someone near you if you're with people near you and discuss what are you bringing to this challenging time. Let's take just one more minute for this, for this exercise and then come back together. Good, let's come back. They will be joining you in the main room in 15 seconds. Great, thank you. We're out. Um... <coughs> George, could you unmute yourself? I had to change the settings here briefly. Perfect. Welcome back. As you were reflecting on it, I was reflecting on it for me. And I think one thing that's, uh, that I have going for me is I happen to have been brought up working class. And one of the characteristics I think of uh, most working class people I've met is we don't expect life to be easy. <laughs> and so if this is one more, uh, if, if this is going to be a very hard challenge, well, it's one more, <laughs> one more challenging thing that's part of, part of life. We all bring what we bring. And the, the, it's the sum total of what we bring that's going to make a difference. And, you, and actually, our country has some things going for us that, uh, that some other countries haven't necessarily had going for them. Uh, there have been a number of countries in which the people have nonviolently prevented a coup or defeated a coup. Um, but they didn't always have uh, some of the things we have. I already mentioned one of the advantages we've got is advanced preparation. It's possible. Uh, my estimate is tens of thousands of people are right now preparing for a possible coup, even though it's extremely important that we be doing get out the vote and, and other, uh, you know, signing up for poll watching and all these other things to try to make the election itself as, uh, as strong as possible. Even so, large membership organizations are forming coalitions with each other, beginning to prepare for a possible power grab. And so that preparation is underway. And then there's an additional uh, 
factor I'd like to remind you of, which is that this past year has been a year in which many people have been waking up and asserting themselves for good causes, for progressive causes. The Black Lives Matter movement has been an enormously uh, uh, widespread. It's, it's it's shown up in towns where they haven't had a demonstration for a long time. And a, a journalist, I think it was a Philadelphia Inquirer journalist, called a small town in rural Pennsylvania, uh, where he heard they just had a demonstration, and he said, w w "When's the last time you folks have had a demonstration?" And the uh, respondent said, "Oh, I don't think we've ever had a demonstration in this town." Well, wait a minute. Uh, I, I'm wrong about the 20 years ago. There was a Ku Klux Klan rally. That was the last time. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that so uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and and before that, the climate, uh, the climate crisis uh, movement. Uh, all those young people involved for the first time in their lives in taking action, doing strikes on Fridays or that kind of thing. Uh, the gun control movement before that also involving teenagers. There's been, and people of all ages. So there've been multiple movements in the last couple of years in which people have stepped up. And that's a very, very big plus for us as we step up for this, if we in fact need to step up for it. And then the third thing I'd like to point out that's special about this country, there are a few other countries like this, but this country has the advantage of a somewhat decentralized power structure. That is to say, all of our governmental eggs are not in one basket, not in the national government. There are states, for example, states that actually defy the uh, federal government on, on various issues. For example, immigration, there are sanctuary states. It's driving the current government crazy that there are, that could be the case. Uh, there are uh, states defying, uh, California keeps defying national policy by setting its own emissions rules for guns, uh, uh, for, for for guns, for cars, and so on and on. There, I can give many examples of that, and not only on the state level, but even the cities have an aggregation of power that is to some degree surprising. There are sanctuary cities, after all. There are cities that go their own way. And in fact, because the national government has uh, so, ha has taken a vacation uh, virtually from responsibility in meeting the COVID, uh, a, cr a crisis, then that has increased the uh, understanding on the part of other power centers. We're going to have to be able to aggregate power and, uh, and implement policies on our own. And so that is also a big uh, plus for us. People will not, as they might in some countries, just roll over because the central government has been taken and that's that. No, it's more complicated here and we can use that complication to our advantage. Now, we are also in good shape in that sense that we have some actual evidence-based knowledge about how to defeat a coup. One source of that is a Quaker political scientist named Stephen Zunas, who did a careful empirical study of 12 coups that have happened in the, the last half century, and uh, what, what transpired in those 12 was that there were mass nonviolent responses to the coup. And what he found was that in eight out of those 12, mass nonviolent response to the coup attempt was successful in defeating the coup, eight out of the 12. So naturally he asked himself, well, what was the secret of their success? what is it that they did right so that they could defeat even military coups. Most of those were in fact military coups. And going up against a nation's military is a very, very tall order indeed. But in eight of these cases, they did so. So what was that? Four keys I can describe that Stephen uh, concluded were really crucial to the success of those of those eight countries. And I'd like to describe those four keys. Uh, now, if Lena, you would uh, go ahead and put a slide in front of us, that'll help us to uh, follow along. Widespread mobilization was very, very important. Now, widespread doesn't have to mean uh, it, in it, it, a widespread 
the, the it doesn't need to mean 80 percent it doesn't need to mean 60 percent it just needs to mean widespread as compared with everyday life and so uh in that in that context we can see that operating in a number of the cases i'll give the example of thailand from stephen's casebook in thailand in 1992 uh, there was a coup attempt by the military and the uh, people mobilized against it in fairly substantial numbers i actually was training at the request of the Buddhists uh, over there. Uh, I was doing some training soon after this uh, this enormous crisis that the Thais underwent, and I heard a lot of first-person stories from people who participated in defeating that coup. Uh, what they told me was that, and this is backed up in Stephen's account, uh, that first there was uh, there, there were hundreds of thousands of people who turned out in various cities, especially in Bangkok, in order to to defeat the coup, but that didn't turn out to be enough. They persisted. They went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And they persisted to the point where the military thought, well, the only way to stop this is going to be to shoot them. The military had up until then been arresting, of course, and roughing people up and the kind of thing you'd expect. But what they decided was they were going to actually line up the soldiers and shoot into these crowds of unarmed people. And they did so with many, many casualties and, and substantial death. The result of that was that way more Thais who had been holding back watching this contest between the military and the people joined the struggle out of a sense of righteous indignation that soldiers would kill and injure uh, unarmed people. And it was that additional increment of Thai participation in the movement uh, and using many more levers instead of just demonstrations, which actually um, are, are only one tactic of the many that are available. It, it extended itself. People were very creative. Taxi, uh, taxi drivers refused to take uh, military people in the taxi. Just all kinds of ways that you could imagine non-cooperating. That became the, the name of the game in Thailand. And they succeeded in defeating their coup, therefore. So that's a good example of that one. And let's keep that in mind. Let's go on to slide two, because there we'll find one that illustrates Stephen's second big key. The second big key for, uh, for defeating uh, an attempted coup, and that is to build alliances outside the usual suspects, <laughs> to reach beyond the choir, as we say. Uh, in, in our context, it would mean going beyond, uh, beyond the progressive uh, movement, the activists that you know will uh, count, uh, can count on to turn out for this or that. Alliance building means going toward the center, the part of the society that's not uh, already committed and very often likes not to commit, <laughs> not to stick its head out, and nevertheless to enroll them and bring them into the movement. An example of that, uh, my favorite one actually, is the example of Germany in 1920, which Stephen Zunis doesn't talk about, but it's one of my favorites because in that case, uh, they, uh, Germany was extremely polarized politically, left versus right much more so than the United States is today, which itself is an interesting point. It means that even if you were a highly polarized society, it doesn't mean you can't defeat a coup because Germany was more polarized than we are and today. And nevertheless, the people won, but they won through alliance building. What happened was that the labor movement was, which was largely socialist and communist, which itself was a tenuous alliance. They very often were not allied. They managed to ally with each other, but also they allied with the center, which, and it was the center party that had been running the government and was thrown out by this coup uh, that was led by a guy named Wolfgang Kopp and a, a, a prominent right winger who had lined up a good part of the military to join him. And so it was he and a, and a general that were doing this coup. And suddenly, over the weekend, an alliance was built 
among these large forces, the leadership of these large forces, such that when Wolfgang Kopp went to the Capitol building to assert, okay, I'm in charge now, he walks into the building and he finds it's empty. There's nobody there. <laughs> because the government workers were responding like workers all over Germany to the uh, refusal to work uh, for the coup and work in, in the condition where a, the coup would be running things. And so the government workers weren't there. So poor Wolfgang Kopp, I'm, don't, I'm not really pitying him, uh, found that he had nobody to type the manifesto which asserted that he was the, uh, the, the uh, commander of the country, that he was the dictator. And so the next day, since the man had not learned how to type, oh yes, men don't learn how to type always. Uh, he came the next day uh, back with his daughter who did know how to type so that she could type the manifesto that said he was running the country. Of course, the place was empty the second day as well and the third day. And by the fourth day, that coup attempt was done. It was finished because there had been such an effective alliance building. Big lesson for us reach outside the people that you usually connect with. Go find the people who are closer to the center and win them over. Let's have our third key. I love telling the stories that go with these keys. This is one that Stephen Zunis uh, this, uh, does, uh, does tell, the, the Russia in 1991. Uh, example. Um, I happened to be in Russia as this one was unfolding. Uh, I was training in Russia at the time. It's not that I, it's not that when I show up in a country, they go into crisis. But anyway, uh, it did happen to be the case that when I was there, they went into that crisis. And the, um, the, the, the our Russian uh, co-trainers who had brought us in to do some training, uh, based, practically locked us into an apartment saying, we don't want you anywhere <laughs> near, uh, near the action, stay here and we will go take the action. And they did. In fact, it became uh, for considering then the Soviet Union, right? Considering they were not used to demonstrating, they, it was definitely not part of the political culture anymore. Um, it was it was a remarkably large thing, and they did do their alliance building. Uh, it, in fact, uh, one of the chief um, opponents to the coup was Boris Yeltsin, who was the president of the Russian Republic. The mayor of Saint Petersburg also spoke out uh, against the coup, and so on. But what this case also really illustrates is the nonviolent discipline paying off because the big, uh, the big uh, worry on the part of the people was the behavior of the soldiers. And especially when the soldiers took up a position in front of the, uh, of the parliament building, which was called the White House, uh, and, but it was a parliament building and the soldiers uh, set up there, were ordered to set up there, put their tanks there and so on. And the idea was since it was being held for the moment by the, uh, the legitimate government, the idea was to clean the people, clean out the, uh, the, th that building from the, of the uh, legitimate people and replace them with the coup plotters. And uh, so it was a very, um, symbolic and important spot to be in. And the people uh, in uh, who were out to defeat the coup realized these soldiers are key. We've got to convince them. So they engaged in a full out set of discussions and conversations with the soldiers, with uh, moms often saying, hey, look, I know you're not going to kill me because you wouldn't kill your mom. And I'm your mom, right? I'm, I, for the tip for today, I'm your mom, and I want you to do the right thing. And on and on and on, they did that hour after hour after hour, day after day. There were some uh, people who were killed by soldiers, but the vast number of soldiers started to come over to the people's side as individuals first, and then entire military units started deserting the army. Do you think of the Soviet Union as a place where people desert the army? <laughs> Entire units uh, leaving in order to be on the side of the people. And that, that was it for the uh, coup plotters. That really uh, was the final signal to them that they were done. There was no way they could maintain a government uh, having 
all of that opposition. And the fourth, the fourth uh, ingredient, the fourth key that Stephen Zunas found was it's important to refuse to recognize illegitimate authority. Now, what's tricky about that, you might say, Did George freeze for you, Francisco? Yes. Uh oh. So a little glitch maybe on George's side. One moment. George, you froze just for a moment as you were talking about the refusal to recognize illegitimate authority, but we're right here with you if you want to pick up right there again. Great, great. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I guess I was saying that one of the things that's tricky about this, even if it seems very natural to you to refuse to expect, accept illegitimate authority, that it won't necessarily seem that way to elected politicians, especially the higher up ones, because the, the, one of the essential skills of politicians that gets them higher and higher is their ability to make deals, <laughs> right? Negotiation is an everyday skill for them. And making deals is one way to get ahead in the uh, electoral game. It, not the electoral game, but in the uh, politicians game. And the politicians, uh, in our country, uh, there, there may be many who are willing to make a deal with Trump and allow him to have a second term, even if he doesn't deserve it, including Democrats. And so uh, it will be really, really important for us in, in order to pull this key off, to put maximum pressure on those who might buckle and try to work out some some way we could get along with this new thing to happen. But it is very, very important. In Argentina, for example, because they did have in 1987, by 1987, they had had military coups in the past and they'd muddled through one way or another. Uh, when there was a government of, of civilians and people were largely pleased with that, but the military was not pleased and therefore staged a coup. So that wasn't unusual in, Thai, in Argentine history. But when the military did that, then the people um, uh, realized, uh-oh, uh, the, the uh, government, that the, the legitimate government is likely to crumble again and allow the military to take over and we better stiffen their spine. So they went on the offensive against the military. They, in fact, invaded a key military base where some of the military plotters uh, were based and, uh, and, and basically took over the base nonviolently. <laughs> Again, by talking with the soldiers over and over and over, look, you don't want to kill me. You, in fact, you need to be on the people's side. The people want democracy. We want to actually elect people and then see them serve. And they were able uh, through, uh, through uh, and also through the growth of the movement, the, the movement just grew hugely. And also by the inspiration of those uh, heroes that were willing to uh, take it to the soldiers level. Uh, all, all of that together meant that the, uh, the, the military coup failed. And, and Argentina moved into a whole new ballgame politically in which uh, they no longer, civilian governments were no longer ruling with an eye behind their back all the time because they might suffer a military coup. So these are four keys that, that, uh, that Stephen found that seem extremely important. And when I look at that, and I'm, okay, it's history, but wait a minute, it's me too. Like I ask myself and I want to ask you also, of these four, since none of us is good at everything, wonder if there's one or two of those that we might 
especially contribute that we might find ways, tactics, and we'll talk tactics later. We might find ways of uh, especially shining with regard to these. Maybe we're awesome at organizing lots of people and we'd love to do that mobilization. Maybe we're really good at advocacy, at reaching, uh, le other, reaching leaders and convincing them to form an alliance with us. Maybe we're especially good at getting into the streets or wherever it is. It doesn't need to be the streets. It can be some, some place that makes more sense in COVID times, uh, but taking, that, taking the, the offense in a way that shows our nonviolent discipline, even though we're being, uh, being punished for it, and, and maybe that's something we can contribute. Or on the other hand, maybe we're especially good at saying no. I, 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 my experience as a dad and granddad and great granddad is two-year-olds are very good at saying no. And so we all have it within us to do that. So what we're going to do is breakout room. Lena's going to help us. No, Francisco is going to help us into uh, breakout rooms. And again, I would like to encourage those who are, are uh, watching via uh, uh, YouTube to, to grab, that, grab that piece of paper and do some of that introspection yourself uh, or conversation with whoever you can rope uh, from around wherever you are. So let's do that. For those of you watching from YouTube, I'll put the four keys up again. The uh, prompt is which of these four keys do you feel most called to that you think you will most bring to this moment?
for those of us uh, following along on YouTube, the question was, which of these four keys are you most called to? Which of these four keys are you most called to? A number of the folks in our Zoom room are in breakout groups. Those will be ending shortly. For those of you following along via YouTube, maybe start wrapping up your thoughts, wrapping up your notes. And we'll come back together in just about 30 seconds or so. Welcome back. I know folks are coming back from your breakout rooms. More folks will be joining us back from their breakouts in a moment. For those of you who are following along via YouTube, I invite you to start wrapping up your reflections on which of these four keys most speak to you. In a number of seconds, everyone will be automatically pulled back from their breakout rooms. And so we'll have folks joining us Again, in just a moment, I believe here they are coming. Welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back everyone. I know those breakout sessions can be a little bit abrupt, but glad you all had a moment to connect with each other. Folks are all getting pulled back sort of automatically right now. Welcome, Welcome back. back, George. Yes. We're here, right? Everyone's back. Great. <laughs> well, I've been in um, some amazing places to be able to do uh, training of people in social change and how to make progress in their countries, but no place more unusual than the Burmese jungle, where I was called uh, again by Buddhists in that part of the world to, to go to um, what, what was called a jungle university, which was a, a, a guerrilla encampment in the jungle of Burma. It was, uh, or Myanmar as we now call it. And this was, um, a matter of smuggling me across and my uh, partner, my facilitation partner, smuggling across the uh, border in order to get into this uh, guerrilla encampment where it was mostly soldiers. And among the soldiers were teenagers and young 20s uh, soldiers who had been university students and who had had to flee the university because they, uh, they had led protests against the dictatorship, the dictatorship didn't like it, uh, attacked them massively, and the students fled into the jungle, and they were met by guerrilla dissidents who were also against the dictatorship, and the guerrillas said, well, uh, you know, you've got malaria, you're 
dead from almost dead from starvation. We will feed you and give you medicine, but you'll need to take a gun and join us in, in return. And they, of course, said yes. So there they were in this jungle uh, girl encampment and feeling very restless because they were supposed to be university students and they're supposed to be studying and preparing to be leaders of their country one day. And they felt like their brains were rotting. And so th these kind of Buddhists, engaged Buddhists um, said, well, if you, you know, if you create a little spot, uh, a, a little spot on your, uh, in your encampment, we will, uh, we will find teachers around the world who will come and teach you. <laughs> and so they found me and I went and did that. And so there, if you can picture the, um, where we were, it was of course jungle and it was a bunch of uh, wooden posts and a thatched roof so that it, when it rained every day, um, you know, we wouldn't get drenched. And there we were, trying to learn. And so uh, at one, one of the things that they were very curious about was political science. They wanted to understand what enables a government to persist. And so I thought, well, the most available metaphor is this very building itself. So I said, okay, let's imagine that the government, the regime that, you, you know, that any uh, country has is, is, the, is the roof. And let's imagine that it's being held up by these posts around the, uh, the outside that are holding this roof up. So what would happen if some of these posts started to get weak? They smiled and said, oh, well, that would mean that the regime would get weak. I said, that's right. Well, what would happen if the regime got scared about it's getting weaker and decided, uh, well, well, we'll, we'll buy more weapons and we'll, we'll get tanks and we'll put them up on the roof to protect us. And the students laughed and said, the roof will come down quicker if they do that. <laughs> so we all had a good laugh about that. And I said, well, what if they notice that, that it, things are getting even more weak and, and, uh, and chaotic and they decide to bring more airplanes and bombs and put those on the roof? And by this time, the students were falling out of their chairs <laughs> with laughter, loving the idea of their dictatorial regime <laughs> collapsing of its own weight because the posts could no longer support it. I said, well, who are the posts? Name them. Who supports the government? Who holds any government up? Well, well, the mass media, right? Mass media helped to support a government. What else? Well, the police, right? So we started naming these different posts by different institutional structures. The military, obviously. Um, the economy. The economy holds the government up. In that country, the family structure holds the government up. So there were these different posts that we were able to identify that held the government up. And I said, so if you had a strategy, not just a burst of enthusiasm, you know, or a mass expression of opinion. In my country, we like to have a protest, go to, the, go to a building and have a protest. And that's a big expression of opinion. But now we're able to move into a way more interesting level. Now we're able to talk about the pillars that hold this structure up. So what if we were to tackle? Which one, which one do you think would be the most vulnerable first to tackle? And the students were so alive and it was just really exciting. What do I know about Burma? I didn't know anything about Burma. Uh, I knew some political theory that was useful to them. They were able to name the posts that looked to them more vulnerable and the posts that looked to them less vulnerable to uh, people pressure. And so we were able to get into tactics from there on how to weaken the posts that hold up the oppression. 
We had such fun doing that. That's what I'd like to have with you tonight. I'd like you to have that fun. <laughs> because that metaphor that we used is just as good for the United States. It's just as good for Norway. It's just as good for Mexico, for any country. It's the case that any regime is only as strong as the pillars that support it. Let's have that slide, Lena, in order to make that doubly clear. Yeah, so here we've got the pillars of power that support the regime, support the status quo. And here are uh, some of the um, pillars that stand out, I think. Obviously, the government workers, as poor Wolfgang Kopp discovered. <laughs> the police are important. The judiciary are important. Judiciary are very important in this, in this country because uh, Mr. Trump has again and again and again tried to do things which the judiciary wouldn't go along with. Uh, and, uh, and, and he failed. He failed in his intention. He has not in his first term been all powerful. And one reason for that is the judiciary says no. Uh, the media, obviously, the military, the politicians, and business. There are more, but these are good to work with. And I especially, since we do have limited time, I would like to focus on the politicians, since those are available everywhere to all of us. And we don't all have access to business leaders. Uh, although many of us do, we don't all have access to the media and so on, but we do all have access to um, politicians. So what I'd like to share is a specific strategy. Uh, there, there've been a number of people emailing me. So George, what's the plan? We all go to Washington in the uh, uh, second week of November, right? <laughs> I say, I hope not. <laughs> no, 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 we could do way better than that. We are not being caught unprepared. We can actually prepare ourselves. We can have a strategy and be more effective that way. Uh, and so this is a, a way to be strategic. So we tackle a, a tackle a pillar. This may not be your favorite pillar to tackle, but be with me on this because if we learn how to tackle this one, then you will, by example, be able to come up with a strategy for tackling uh, your 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 other fa another favorite if you've got another favorite. So let's go more deeply into the strategy question by tackling the politicians. Lena, let's have the next slide. Okay, so this is a chance to speak truth to power, as Quakers like to say. Actually, it's become a phrase now in common use. Uh, the elected officials' uh, strategy. Uh, for resource, you can find an article by me that I wrote laying this out in an online publication, some of you I know, already know, wagingnonviolence.org. So you can always check that out later. But uh, here, here, here's the quick and dirty version of it. Do you choose an elected official that you focus on? And then you demand that they commit publicly that every vote will be counted. That's an important demand. Because as far as the uh, political science and sociology folks that I've talked with can figure out, even though beginning with November 4th, things are going to be very complicated. And there are particular dates when particular things happen, when legislators, uh, le state legislatures appoint uh, the Electoral College and when the Electoral College meets and so on and so on. And it can get bewildering and too complicated simply to make a demand about. But this turns out to be a very, very powerful demand. Because if we say that we're not going to accept as legitimate any government that, af uh, that, that ignores votes and leaves them uncounted, we're putting ourselves in a very strong position. So we can demand every politician, whether Republican, Democrat, whatever, uh, independent, uh, can uh, will commit, not just tell us, oh, I hear your point of view. Yes, of course, you're right. It, this is the United States of America. We should count all the votes. 
No, no, no. You need to politic. You need to say publicly, publicly, that you are committing to count every vote. Now, uh, put yourself in the position of an elected official. Are you going to want to refuse that demand? Are you want it, going to want it to be known that it doesn't matter to you whether votes are counted or not? <laughs> if you're an elected official, you're pretty guaranteed to, it, it, it will be very hard for you to refuse this. On the other hand, some will delay. They will come up with all kinds of arguments for not doing it. And so that gives you the opportunity to use nonviolent action, which is key in winning uh, this struggle, uh, to use nonviolent action to pressure them to commit. And uh, of course, you can make drama. One of the great things about novel action is uh, it can be uh, bring your creativity into it and you can use, uh, use it for drama. And you can also invite more and more allies to join you. Remember, alliance building is key. So instead of going to your elected officials with the people you know best, deliberately don't do that. Go, uh, line up the uh, clergy people in your, uh, in your town or city or area that uh, you don't know and, uh, and bring them, uh, the, the rabbis, the imams, the, the people who uh, are religious leaders, bring them or bring business leaders that you don't know already or bring another category of people you don't know that college president down the road, well, it's time you do. Bring the opinion leaders uh, that you don't know, but who represent or in some way, um, and in some cases like union leaders actually can bring masses of people into action. Um, go, visit, go visit these uh, politicians with them. It, they will not think you're kooky to want to visit Uh, it's not an impossible thing to do and 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 how gratifying because you expand yourself remember my analogy in the beginning of this evening which was a seed is planted in ground that's already broken up so it has half a chance to grow but growing is for it expansion it's not staying the same i don't understand anybody frankly who wants to be the same person in January that they are today. This is an opportunity for growth. As the seeds grow, we can grow. We can expand in our power. We can expand in our spiritual power. We can expand in our understanding. We can expand in our connections with our communities and with people who are beyond our communities. We can expand and grow. And this is history's way of breaking the ground and providing an opportunity for you, seed of God, to grow. And I am thrilled with that opportunity. I am grateful at age 82 that I have lived long enough for this opportunity. I am grateful and I thank God for it. So let's use these opportunities. This is no time to hide. This is no time for the seed to hide beneath the ground, complaining because there's a rock next to it. The rock doesn't surround them. And some wise gardener tried to break up the ground, make it easy for us to grow. And that is the nature of history right now. I'm not saying history is wise or attributing personality to it, but I am saying, <laughs> I am reaching for a metaphor that can inspire us to go beyond where we are at this particular moment in time, because we're meant to grow. It is our nature. Okay, so that's what, uh, that's what my strategy is. And uh, the Choose Democracy website, I'm part of a team called Choose Democracy, and we're online, uh, choosedemocracy.org, has this pledge and is advocating that everybody use this pledge. Let me just say another word about uh, this pledge uh, that, that focuses on the, uh, the vote. We, in the uh, 1980s, 
a number of you will remember that in the 1980s, uh, the United States was very, very challenged by, by the country of, of Nicaragua because it, it was becoming independent of the American empire, which from the point of view of, of our uh, rulers um, is, is outrageous. The American empire should be accepted by all of our, uh, all of uh, those we run. And, and uh, that, that country didn't want any longer to be part of the American empire. And just as Vietnam had earlier refused to be part of the American empire, War in order to make I think George maybe froze again. He's been coming back to us, but it is a little choppy. Thanks for holding with us, folks. And I think this might be a bandwidth thing on his side, unfortunately. Did we lose him? Hmm. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Welcome back. Hey, thank you, thank you. Where did uh, where did I uh, lose you? Where did you lose me? Um, you were just starting to talk about um, Honduras and the U.S. empire not being too happy with losing ground. Yes, right. So it was Ronald Reagan's job as head of the empire to uh, send troops to Honduras uh, as, as a staging area to be I'm able sorry, to- I'm sorry, Nicaragua and Honduras, sorry. Sorry? I just realized I, I misprompted you. You were talking about Nicaragua. Oh, was I? Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't talk about Ronald Reagan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we missed most of that. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was very alarming to the uh, the power lead in our country that uh, Nicaragua might want to go its own way. And so uh, it was Ronald Reagan's job as president to make sure that that didn't happen. And so, uh, you know, following the Vietnam pattern, you put a lot of troops in and you insist that people do what we want rather than what they want. Uh, the idea was to put troops in Honduras, invade Nicaragua, and insist that they shape up and be good, uh, you know, good members of the empire. And the um, uh, and, and and he was prevented from doing that. And one of the major uh, means we used to prevent him from doing that was huge numbers of Americans signed a pledge of resistance, saying if the United States invades uh, Nicaragua, then we will go all out to commit civil disobedience every every place we can that has to do with the federal government and uh, and make that sacrifice in order to make our point and to stop this outrage from going on. And so many people signed that, and it was so clear that we were determined to do that that uh, that that became one uh, one part of the calculation about whether the U.S. could get away with doing that and decided not to. So this is a similar kind of thing. It's a pledge of resistance brought up to date that has to do with the possibility uh, that our reckless president will want to do that. And, uh, and, and uh, so choosedemocracy.org, no, choosedemocracy.us, excuse me, choosedemocracy.us uh, is the place where you can take that pledge and find other resources that will be useful with regard to this question, including upcoming trainings that you can refer your friends to. So uh, uh, this is, uh, you're seeing right now what the pledge is. We will vote and we will refuse to accept election results until all the votes are counted. And we will now violently take to the streets. That's uh, in quotes, because actually there are a number of tactics that we can use that uh, that are not taking to the streets. For example, yes, for example, 
let's say you were going to go after the uh, the elected officials to use that particular strategy. Maybe that's a pillar that attracts you, or that's the strategy that's handiest for you, depending on where you live. And so uh, one of the things you could do is a motorcade going by the house of that elected official uh, with signs and so on, and tooting horns and so on, in order to make the point. Uh, another uh, that, That's a, a, a way of being safe with regard to COVID and also making the point very strongly. Uh, you could send people in socially distanced depending on where their office is located uh, or outside the office on, on, the, uh, on the sidewalk, outside the office. So uh, there are a number of suggestions actually that are coming that we're, we're beginning to make now that would enable people to, to take this um, take the strategy further and make it practical uh, so that people could take the degree of risk that they want to take. Some people could, uh, could decide to do a, a one after another kind of thing. So you go out, you go in at 10 a.m. And, and sit there and refuse to, uh, re refuse to stop talking about the importance of this election until they arrest you. And then I will come after you and do the same and then Joan will come after you, and then Philippe will come after me, and so on and so on. And so, so on it goes. You can, with creativity, think of tactics that are safe for you to do and that will escalate your being on the offensive in order to make it clear to the elected official they, in order to <laughs> get us off their backs nonviolently, uh, they will need to make this public demand. If that pillar weakens substantially, it's going to make a difference to the uh, possibility of the, of the coup being successful, if it happens. Yeah, Lena, let's go on to the last section because I know we're also eager to get some time in for questions. And these are some tips on the possibility of violence. Because who knows what will happen? And there may be in your area, some people who will want to do violence to you because they are, uh, they disagree with you politically. Or uh, there might be some people, even if you're socially distanced or if you've decided to take the risk as many people did in Black Lives Matters and be closer to other people in demonstrations, um, you may find that some of the people in the uh, vicinity that you are with are uh, engaging in, um, in, in behavior that could escalate things. Uh, then there are things we can do about that. And this training itself, or this isn't a really a training, it's a first Monday lecture. So this isn't really a training where we'll get into peacekeeping, but the good news is that choosedemocracy.us will have peacekeeping, already has uh, started to list peacekeeping trainings that you will be able to take. So if you are concerned about the question of the risk of violence, be sure to take peacekeeper trainings. But I wanted to share a little bit right now. One is uh, to de-escalate, slow things down. It's a great, uh, pretty much every demonstration I go to now, <laughs> I keep that one in mind. George, slow things down. Because I can get amped up by the excitement of a crowd. And it's really important for me to keep remembering, de-escalate, don't raise the, volume, don't raise the level of energy, de-escalate it. And the second thing, the second doubt, uh, the, the second quote is my all-time favorite quote because it is so contrary to common sense <laughs> and it turns out to be so true. Uh, I learned it first in France in the early 60s uh, no, it was mid 60s when I was uh, there for a work camp and I was talking with a bunch of French people and, and they were very involved with opposing the Algerian war because France was in danger of losing its empire at the time and didn't want to let go of Algeria. 
And so the, I, I was asking these French activists, what have you been learning from your experience? Because I know that your police tend to be extremely tough. They do a lot of violence to demonstrators. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there are segments of the French police who traditionally were in, kept in separate barracks away from the population, and not like our police who live with families and live on a street in a neighborhood, but kept in barracks so that when they were summoned to go and subdue a demonstration, they felt freer to be very violent. Uh, so knowing that things were very tough in France at the time, I said, what have you learned? Uh, that might be useful to others. And they said, the th main thing we learned was that when things are escalating and it looks like trouble, sit down. I said, that works? I know what I want to do is run away. <laughs> they said, that's what we want to do. <laughs> but what we found through trial and error was that if we sit down, and get as many of our gang to sit down wherever they are, that fewer people get hurt. And those who do get hurt, get less hurt than running. The very next year, I got a chance to talk with Andrew Young, who was Martin Luther King's right hand at the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he was meeting with a bunch of us organizers and in an off the record, not off the record, but a, a kind of informal chat. And uh, so we, we, we were talking about tactics on the street when you're out there doing protests and so on. And he said, uh, well, you know, we're a bunch of preachers in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And you've noticed that we very often, when we're, uh, when we're going down the street and the police set up a blockade uh, the, that we often urge our people to go down on their knees and pray. Uh, yes, we've seen that on TV and so we know you do that. Well, he said, you probably figure that's because we're asking for the Lord's help. We nodded. And indeed we are, said he. But the other reason is because it's very hard for people to run on their knees. And we said, what? Do you mean? He said, what we found is that in confrontations where our people start running, there's more injury, more casualties by far than if we pray or in a secular sense, you know, if it weren't us preachers, people simply sitting down. That actually slows down the police and makes it much, much, much harder for them to hurt us. So I thought, well, this is interesting. France, Southern United States, where else is this going to turn out to be true? So when I was leading a training in um, Southeast Asia that had people from Cambodia and from Laos and from Thailand all there together, uh, I had to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and they, in their language groups, you know, had discussions, and, uh, and uh, what would be their response? I asked the question, what do you do when the police or the soldiers, the, uh, the army, uh, starts uh, attacking you? And they said, we sit down, and that reduces the casualties and means that those who are hurt are hurt less. So what we've got is a kind of cross-cultural sample of a dynamic that suggests to me that this is not about words. It's not about principles. It's not about, um, no, it, it, it's, it's sub, sub-verbal. We're talking about body behavior. We're talking about reading of bodies. That's a very, very, uh, uh, that, that's not on a conscious theory, theory level. That's, that's a very uh, different level. And it's a kind of dance that we're dancing on the street when we go out there and are faced with violence. And the question is, how can we do our dance in a way that is automatically, not through a filter, not through a theory, not through a batch of words, automatically uh, inhibiting to the impulse of our attackers. 
to attack us and to hurt us. And that's what works. So I like it partly because it's counterintuitive. <laughs> and I like it mainly because it works. I think we have another one, Lena. Do we have another one on this question of violence? Yeah. Of course, we can minimize the likelihood of even being in that situation. And one way of doing that is to choose the tactics that keep us, uh, uh, that, that just make it very, very unlikely. For example, if in going after your elected officials, you're, you're uh, doing it uh, socially distanced, but in their, in their, uh, in, in the hallway, outside their, their office, that kind of thing, it's very unlikely that, that people will find you there to, to beat on you. Uh, so, so thinking about tactics, again, I mentioned that motorcade where you're in cars, you're slowly going down the street uh, beside the house, uh, or you're, you're going into the, uh, the church where the, uh, the elected official worships, or you're outside the church, but very close to the prox in proximity to the church or to the synagogue or to the, uh, the mosque or wherever it is that that elected official uh, may, may worship. Uh, you can choose your time and place, in other words, in such a way uh, as to reduce the likelihood of violence. Daytime is much safer than nighttime, for example. So use your tactical head and reduce the likelihood of violence. Number two, meet the violence with de-escalation, and we've already talked about that. And then number three, if it happens, if violence happens, then as it has to me, I've been beaten by police, I've been beaten by a gang of young, uh, young guys who were very upset with, 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 uh, with a demonstration that happened in their community and they, they were able to isolate uh, my buddy and I and they were able to jump on us. I think it was eight or nine of them were jump, jumped on us at once. Um, I've, 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 I've experienced this. And uh, if it happens, because there's no way to say that it cannot happen, then expose it, expose it and contrast it with your own behavior, which is one of the major reasons why it makes sense to be nonviolent. Yes, you may have a scruple about violence. You may be a pacifist as I am myself. And, uh, and therefore you refuse on principle to injure someone else. But even if that's not the case, and you are willing under some circumstances to use violence in this context, it doesn't actually make sense because Stephen Zunas has done the research. And if you believe in evidence-based knowledge, you will do what makes sense for defeating a coup. And so, so since nonviolence is the way to go in defeating a coup, then, uh, then uh, and if the violence happens, then expose it and contrast it with your own behavior, which as I've said, uh, is, is most successful and most sensible if, if it is nonviolent. I'm so keen to find out what the questions are, Lena. Do we have any time left for questions? We do have time left for questions. So it's 8.40, we actually have 20 minutes. Um, and so the invitation, um, Francisco has been reviewing the YouTube channel for questions and comments. If you'd like to submit a question via YouTube, go ahead and type it there. Francisco will be reviewing that. We will not be taking questions verbally because there are so many of us here. Please type them into the chat and Francisco or I will see them and we'll read them aloud um, for uh, George to respond to that way. Um, and I will say right now, I can already tell from the number of questions we've had coming in, we're not gonna be able to get to every question tonight, I'm afraid. But please do type your questions into the chat. Um, I already have a couple um, that I could start with here. Um, so this question comes from um, Joanna Haymore. George, could you say more about key number four, which was um, refusing to accept the legitimacy of an illegitimate government? If we need, we'll shut down the country to uh, yeah, if, if we need, 
we will shut down the country to of the democratic process. Can you um, say more about that point? Well, it means not temporizing, not saying, uh, well, we'll wait and find out what the Supreme Court says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, that will be an obvious dodge, right? This is, the lawyers are, I assume, already uh, delighted <laughs> with the situation. So, so this, this, is, this could go on weeks, friends. This could go on months. There are political scientists who have written a view that it's conceivable that there will be two people showing up for Inauguration Day, Jan January 20th. So we, we may be in for a long time of this. Now, it's, it's enormously tempting, uh, I believe, for top uh, 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 people in the National uh, Democratic Party to temporize and try to work out some kind of solution that's a compromise, uh, compromise and uh, you know would allow uh, Donald Trump to continue to play a role. And um, I, I'm not accusing them of that. That's just a, a cynicism that I have because that's my experience with elected officials that they're very, very into making deals. And, uh, and I think we shouldn't stand for it. We shouldn't stand for it. And that's why getting onto elected officials, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or independents, getting onto them early and then holding them accountable, even your town council person, even your county commissioners, all kinds of elected officials, go after them and, uh, and hold them accountable. Uh, that's extremely important. But then there, is, there comes a point where, since we all interact with government in one way or another, uh, where we get to say, no, I'm not going to interact with you because the, order, the transition in leadership in our country has not been affected. And I look at, I, I, I check the news every day and I find out that Donald Trump's still in office and that's not okay. So, uh, yeah. If, if, it, if it comes to that, if it comes to that January 21st, we really don't know because this is an unprecedented situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Francisco, do you have any questions from YouTube? Not yet. A lot of good comments, but not necessarily questions. So I, I favor I continue with a bunch of questions on Zoom. Great. Yeah, I have a bunch here. Um, uh, this one is from uh, Tracy. Trump is sowing seeds already to delegitimize the election. What can we do to prepare for the communications and challenge of deflecting that narrative? Fortunately, um, most of us don't have to worry about that. Uh, that is in the hands of, I think, highly competent people who I trust. I, I do trust uh, the Democratic party's leadership to be on it. Plus the groups that we all know, these national uh, membership organizations, Sierra Club, Indivisible, you know, there are so many large uh, uh, progressive interest groups who have research departments and have highly competent people and have the ear of the media. And, uh, and, and, and of course, people within the media themselves, the mainstream media, uh, are on it. So thank goodness, uh, that's, that's one thing. I mean, I don't know who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm talking to uh, some, you know, maybe I'm talking to the president of Indivisible, but uh, if so, yeah, get on it. Uh, but I think most of us can count on them to take care of that. Um, another question here is that we, you talked about the police and the military, but the situation in the U.S. is different. A lot of people own firearms um, and are ready to use them out of fear or out of the, I'm sort of editorializing on this comment, out of um, encouragement um, from Trump. How do we deal with this? Yes. Here we can be inspired I'm, I'm inspired in many ways, but here especially we can be inspired by the civil rights movement because the most daily danger the deep south part of the civil rights movement was in was coming from the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan 
as you know, uh, what has been the largest terrorist organization in America uh, for decades, for decades and decades, it was the largest terrorist organization and it oper uh, operating in the North as well as in the South, but it was especially in the South where they ran things. And so, um, along with the white citizens councils who you also wouldn't want to meet on a dark night. So um, what, what inspires me about the civil rights experience is that they were able to survive knowing that is what they were facing. They were facing the Ku Klux Klan, especially in Alabama and Mississippi, but also in Georgia. Uh, Reverend Young, Andrew Young, who I referred to earlier, um, did this. He heard that the Ku Klux Klan was getting frisky again because the civil rights movement was getting frisky in that part of Georgia where Andrew Young's pastor was, his Methodist church. And uh, they were going to have one of those, you know, bonfires out in the woods and rev each other up and get each other excited so they could do some more terror work. And uh, Reverend Young said to his congregation, time we go out and talk to them. This is a black congregation. Let's go out and talk to them. And a bunch of the braver ones said, okay, let's go, Reverend. And they went into the woods and found the Ku Klux Klan and engaged them in conversation. And defused the plan that the KKK had to terrorize them by doing so. Big lesson there. When we allow our fear to prevent us from reaching out toward our adversaries, we're giving ground away to them and shrinking ourselves. So what we need to do is say, no, this is our country as much as anybody's and we are entitled to, uh, to, to protest without fear that somebody's going to whack us in the head or knife us or shoot us. And if we hear that there are people who are thinking about that, where are they like that? I'll tell one more story to that effect. I urge you, by the way, by all means, if you're concerned about this question of what to do about these informal people uh, the, who are Yes, there's already been a loss of life um, by a protester in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, Texas is also a dangerous place. Um, uh, so, so another story that might inspire you, but I started to say the movie Freedom Song. I so recommend the movie Freedom Song. You've seen it, Lena. <laughs> and it shows, the, uh, it shows SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These were young people young people who decided we will go into Mississippi, young black people going into Mississippi, knowing the Ku Klux Klan was everywhere. And, uh, and, and then they, they, they managed to survive for a couple of years, 63, uh, 62, 63. And in 64, they invited a, a thousand Northerners to come and join them in the Mississippi project. And I was, um, I was honored to be invited to be part of the training for the uh, for the thousand uh, who were invited. It was turned out to be nine hundred something uh, who who were invited to uh, to go down to Mississippi, and so we did this training job. And it, I, I therefore got to talk with the director of that project, uh, Bob Moses. I said, Bob, uh, how is it that you are? Um, that you are able to survive. Like uh, you, you, you can't get protection from the local law enforcement people. They are putting on sheets at night. <laughs> They're in the Ku Klux Klan. You, you aren't gonna get protection from the state. The state wants you dead. You can't get protection from Washington because the Kennedy brothers, John Kennedy's brother, Robert, who's head of the Justice Department, want to keep a thousand miles away from you. They don't want to touch you. Uh, what, how do you survive? And he said, it's because we don't have guns in our freedom houses and everyone knows it. So there's enormous power in our courage 
this sets aside this conventional means of being courageous by getting a gun. There's enormous power in that. And so what we do is we use that power and mobilize that. And that includes going out and finding people who want to do ill toward us and talking to them over and over and over and taking a beating if that's what it takes. Another question. I have one from, from YouTube. Uh, Jane asks, what do you see as the military's role in a possible cop in our setting? Giving to many generals have spoken out against Trump. Well, we're very lucky in that way, aren't we? Yes, so many coups are military coups. But in this case, oh, what a relief. Uh, I, was, I, I thought it ended up being really positive that uh, President Trump tried to do that um, Bible showing photo op <laughs> in front of the White House, you remember? He, he was out, out on the uh, street. First, first um, uh, I mean, nobody can justify, you know, it's, it's terrible that they took th that nonviolent demonstration and swept it aside, tear gas, hurting people and everything else. Um, but they used military units in order to do that. And uh, the, the White House did use military units to do that. And, uh, and therefore, the positive outcome of that, and very often violence rebounds, it backfires, right? And this is a perfect example of violence back backfiring because their violence against nonviolent demonstrators then led military generals, as, as said, and recently retired military generals who are obviously speaking for the active service people to tell Trump, that's it, buddy. Don't you even think of using the military in order to, uh, in order to uh, advance your partisan goals. And that's enormous relief to us. I don't think it's going to be hard to win this, this, this struggle. And that's one reason we don't have to face the military. We don't even have to train for that. Another question. Um, this one comes from Sarah. What about the photos of police taking a knee, et cetera, and allegations that the pictures are staged? I, I, I think uh, every, the Russians were right. The Russians were right. They looked at those soldiers, they looked at the tanks and they said, those are human beings, go after them. <laughs> and they started pulling the soldiers away, right? And even entire military units. Now, that, those weren't American soldiers. Uh, th those were Soviet soldiers. You would think they'd be highly disciplined, uh, very hard to convince to do something different, but they were convinced. That is the attitude we need to accept. We go after people, we go after police. We don't assume that police are all one kind. It's just not even true. My brother is a police, was a police officer. It's not true that uh, I, we're allowing our fear to run away with us if we ascribe inhumanity to people because they put on a uniform. I'm not, I, of course, I have been beaten by police. It's not that I'm a great fan uh, certainly of armed police or, or of the way uh, the, 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 the way that police system systematically enforce white supremacy in this country and so on. Uh, of course, I need no lessons about that. The important thing is to not become so in love with that particular truth that we overlook the other truth, which is that things are always more complicated than they seem. And we need to be willing to deal with the complexity of a range of human beings. Yes, there's a range of human beings in the police. Some, of course, will take the knee. Of course, some police will help us. They will either, in, in those cases of photographed um, uh, and, and on the news, people actually risking, the, uh, you know, ri risking retaliation within the ranks by publicly associating themselves with us. That kind of thing will go on. Expect that to go on. Again, 
I keep emphasizing, this is our opportunity to grow. So whatever it is at this point in time, I'm 82, you're the age you are, whatever age you are, your view of the world still has opportunity to grow and become more complex. You have still truth out there that you can grab onto because truth is so big, it's so enormous, it's so complex. We'll never get all of it, right? And so what God gives us the opportunity to do, thank God we've got brains. The opportunity we've got is to put ourselves in situations where we will be stretched. We will see things that we wouldn't have thought we could see. We will see police acting in ways that we didn't think they could because we had them stereotyped. We will see wonders. Do you want to see miracles? Then act in such a way as to open miracles to happen before you. If you close your mind to miracles, you're not likely to see them. And this is one of the magical things about nonviolent action to me. Yes, it can be regarded as a non-magical thing. It can be regarded as a political science subject and so on and so on. I'm all for it. Uh, the scholars of nonviolence have been coming to my trainings. And I'm delighted that they're there. But for speaking as a Quaker and speaking as a person with a deep sense of, of <laughs> I'm so tempted to say the magical side of, of the world, the miraculous side of the world, um, we need to be open to these surprises. And we can be open. We can support each other to be open. And when we hear each other stereotype reality, we can say, wait a minute, it may be more complicated than that. And nonviolence puts us out of our comfort zones into the direction of the miraculous. And again, I'm not saying this, the, the empirical world of study is not important. Lena knows we've worked on research together. <laughs> I'm all for the, uh, you know, the, the, the more skeptical uh, intellectual operations that are involved in scholarship. And at the same time, as a human being, I'm more than that. And we all are. Another question, please. Well, I'm also looking at our time and appreciating that that could be a high note to end on, but there are more questions. I'm sure we could ask questions infinitely, um, but I do also want to respect, um, we said you were going to close at nine. Um, you just landed so powerfully, George. I don't know if um, you have a closing thought or something you just want to wrap up with or. I can't do better than that. That came from <laughs> spirit with uh, very little. Uh, with practically no self-restraint. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should say, Lena, in fairness, that uh, the, the waging nonviolence.org, uh, uh, you know, uh, publication online is, uh, it has a number of articles by me on this subject and on, uh, and also a number of articles by me on facing attack and you know, how, how to deal with attack and so on. So it is a resource. Uh, it's also got a marvelous article that's gone viral by Daniel Hunter called 10 Stops, 10, 10 Steps Toward Defeating a Coup. So it's a real resource. And I hope folks will go on wagingnonviolence.org mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and have a good time with that too. Okay. But thank you so much, Lena and Francisco for inviting me to, to yes, to, to be with all these good people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being with us, George. And um, just one thing to emphasize for those of you who wanna pick up this work and keep running with it, choosingdemocracy.us does have um, trainings which are different than what we did tonight. Tonight, uh, this was a little bit more of um, painting the broad picture, bringing it back to spirit. Um, if you want to learn more about some of these trainings, you can go to choosingdemocracy.us and um, there are a number of dates you can sign up for there. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be um, continuing our first Monday lecture series um, and the first Monday in November, um, which for those of you paying attention at home is the Monday before election night. And we'll be joined by Eileen Flanagan um, who will be uh, speaking about what happens Wednesday. Um, and I think continuing some of these themes of, of spirit-led 
uh, action and uh, care for our democracy. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for everyone listening along on YouTube and thank you, George, so much. Thank you and see you later. See you later. Yeah. Some of you can join us tomorrow for meeting for worship. Mm -hmm. And George, much gratitude to you for always being a great companion to Pendle Hill. Mm, you know, I'm a booster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night, friends. Good night, friends. Good night.